Welcome to A Matter of Doubt, the atheist podcast and all things philosophy. This is episode 36, and we're recording on August 16th, 2012. This is the podcast that brings you the best deconversion stories, a little bit of counter-apologetics, and just general conversation about atheism and religion. Today, I've got my uh, usual co-host, Brian, with me. How you doing, everyone? All right. And today, we are very excited about our special guest. To me, he's sort of a famous person in the atheist world. But um, anyhow, he's um, he was a Pentecostal preacher for 25 years and now is the has been the first graduate of the Clergy Project and since coming out has been traveling the country telling his story very passionately. And uh, welcome to A Matter of Doubt, Jerry DeWitt. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. So uh, I guess we want to get started and uh, let you tell your story with uh, the passion that uh, I saw you tell it <laughs> in uh, Augusta. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you guys. It was a really... No, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, it has been um, a very exciting year. Obviously, it has been um, difficult as well as everyone by now, I'm sure, knows and is tired of hearing about. But um, but at the same time, it's it's been very, very exciting getting to um, – I've always enjoyed learning. And, mm. and I know it sounds somewhat egotistical to my believing friends, but, but I think the fact that I enjoyed learning so much – is is really what they would consider to be my problem <laughs> because you know because the process for me never stopped i i moved out of a very fundamentalist conservative version of pentecostalism worked my way um theologically all the way to a very liberal form of of um uh the charismatic movement and you know Everybody in my community handled that fairly well. Uh, I did lose some family and friends along the way, even during that process. So I'm oh, wow. I'm no I'm no stranger to religious rejection, but I, I didn't stop there. You know, the process that was working in my mind of trying to get to the bottom of things and to truly understand what was true and what was reality, it, it just didn't stop uh, for me. Where where it stopped for so many of my family and friends and so it, it worked its way all the way out of religion and that took a course of 25 years you know and uh, as as someone yelled out at me at in austin texas when i said that you know they yelled you're a slow learner <laughs> you know and so so yeah I, I was i was i was not only a slow learner i was a very reluctant learner because everything, every time that I could see that I was about to have to accept uh, a new principle or a new a new piece of truth, I could also at the same time see um, what it was going to cost me and and or my family. And so I was I was a very reluctant learner, and it took me 25 years to finally get to the place that my conscience could not bear the duplicity anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I I stumbled across the clergy project and. When I got there, I thought that I had met people who were in worse situations than mine. I felt like I had it pretty good and took a chance and got halfway outed by some, you know, by a relative and then went ahead and tried to do a little damage control and finished outing myself. And uh, it's, you know, that, the, as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that you're better off now that you've done this and gone through this yes. entire process? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I, I, I do. I do feel like I'm better off. Now, I, I've always tried to, uh, as I've said before, uh, I feel like my only superpower is transparency and being, and being vulnerable. And so I try to be honest about it. Uh, I still grieve a good bit. I still grieve over the loss of uh, a family. Um, hmm. I would um, – I, I wouldn't be much of an honest person if I didn't say I also grieve my loss of favor with the community. I had worked very hard for many years to uh, to earn 
quite a reputation within the community of mm-hmm. being a Mr. Fix-It and a go-to guy and um, even had a, a career that was building towards running for the mayor of my town uh, in 2014. And, you know, I, I, I there's no other word for it. I, I grieve at the loss of that just – just uh, two nights ago, I went to a. We don't we don't call our counties counties. We call them parishes, mm-hmm. and and so I went to a parish meeting, and uh, you know as I walked out watching, you know watching people that I normally would have um, spoken to and visited with after the meeting, watching them for lack of better words congregate in in small groups in corners and 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 know that I was now alien to. You know, to my home environment. Um, you know, it was it was sad. It was sad to walk off from there and, you know, like the Lone Ranger, just drive off into the sunset. You know, sure. um, but there's always there's always a payoff. There's always a payoff to this type of um, this type of, of of sacrifice. And and the payoff uh, is is people like yourselves. The relationships that I've made, where I can be honest, where I can be myself. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed the notoriety that I've received. You know, obviously my story is a little sensational. And so, um, I've enjoyed, you know, the great speaking events, speaking at the American Atheist Convention right after the Reason Rally. Um, I heard that speech. It was awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was very much off the cuff and, and was just a roll of the dice just to see if, to see if it would work, you know, to see if it was <laughs> acceptable. Um, you know, so yeah, there's, uh, I have now instead of hundreds of friends who, um, liked me because of a false identity or an identity that I grew out of. Now I literally have thousands of friends who like me for who I really am. And so, mm-hmm. um, so it, it's great benefit. And, and I feel like that the further I get away from this year, of chaos and uh, the further along the path I go of rebuilding my life, um, the more benefit I'm going to receive and the more I'm going to enjoy it. But regardless, even if there was no friends, if I had not made a single friend, if I had not made a single speech, if there was not even an ounce of community, um, it would still be worth it because this is what a a human being of integrity does so that's that's where Mm. i'm coming from yeah i like that it sounds like that like most atheists you are a lover of truth and you just couldn't resist following where that takes you yes that that is correct that is exactly what uh what has transpired um there was there was no way for me there was no way around it you know people I, I enjoy when people say oh you know you're so brave you're so courageous and and of course you know that strokes my ego as it would anyone's but I I try to be honest about it and I say I say you know I'm I'm no more brave than the guy who jumps out of the second story window because his house is on fire you know it's hmm. uh, it's something that i consciously had to do and and i did have intentions in the very beginning um of my deconversion i had intentions to just kind of fly under the radar and 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 live a normal life um but all the while my my love for truth and my love for people was making me very um for lack of better words, very hungry to be back involved in people's lives. And and I thought for a time I could stay under the radar and I could just work with the clergy project and I could work online with Recovering from Religion and, and satisfy that need to help people. Um, but then, you know, then I had a relative who stumbled across the changes I had made on Facebook and, and uh, you know, brought those changes to my family's attention for the sake of prayer so that they could pray for me of course uh, yeah mm-hmm. but you know, not, not they not, had good intentions they wanted to help you yes they they wanted to help me they they wanted to help me not just gossip about me but help me obviously and uh, and so um 
you know, that, that, that started a conversation within my family. And then, as I said, I, I felt like I needed to do a little damage control. And I, I, at that time, had about 200 friends on Facebook, something like that. And I l- looked through all of them, and there were only eight people that I felt like that I was close enough to that I should send a personal letter to, uh, or at least a letter over Facebook to. And um, one of those one of those people was very interesting, and uh, apparently his his self confidence in the in our community was was actually lower than mine at the moment, and he felt like he found someone that was uh, more vulnerable than than himself. <laughs> so he he quickly uh, shared this personal letter with everyone he could find, and it was kind of funny because he would run through town, going from office to office, uh, telling people about it. And I knew I, I knew at any given point in the day where he was at by the print <laughs> request that I was receiving over Facebook, you know, so they could see all of my new friends so you know and and so then i just begin to i begin to speak out about it so you know it's um it, it's something that i feel like i almost feel like it's part of being human i i, I do i feel I, I don't almost feel like it is i feel like it is i feel like it's a very important part of being human you had mentioned that if it's safe to say that the your deconversion started at the point at which you started to value truth above all else is, is that a fair statement yeah that, uh, is, that is very fair. Could you point us to anything in particular that made you get to that point where you wanted to value truth over anything else? Was there a specific moment or experience that got you to value that? Yeah, there there, there really was. And, and, and it's not going to sound as philosophical or as interesting as, as others. But what, what happened for me was I, I had been raised um, – you know, in a in a Pentecostal world, um, under the umbrella of a very fundamentalist Pentecostal uh, doctrine, and quite honestly, had never thought two seconds about it. You know, it was uh, I was very aware of the dress code. I was aware of of lifestyle requirements, but but was never really. I never gave much thought to the doctrine. Until I was 17, I got saved at Jimmy Swaggart's church and immediately felt a call to, to preach, to be in the ministry. And when it, when it became my obligation uh, to teach these doctrines to the congregations, uh, it's, it's something I took very seriously. And because I loved people so much, I didn't find it easy to get up and just repeat or to regurgitate what I had been fed all of those years. Instead, I wanted to get to the bottom of it myself. I wanted – before I could get up and tell people that they were – that women were going to burn in hell forever for trimming their bangs. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, exactly. I, I needed to know that that was true. You know, and, 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 and I'm fortunate – I'm fortunate that for whatever reason, um, maybe it's just a personality trait – I, I, I truly did have a love for um, for truth and thus for science, and and had a vague understanding of the scientific method. You know, I mean, I I went to school, went to high school. I didn't go to any secondary education because our particular version of Pentecostalism uh, frowned on it and actually just for, forbid it. Um, well, you don't need to be smart to be saved, right? No, you don't need to be smart to be saved. And 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 what they what they found was was that whenever they would send uh, their young uh, conservative children off to college, even to some versions of Bible college, they would come back as liberal adults. <laughs> and, and so you know, imagine that. And God so, forbid. You know that that wasn't that wasn't something that they that they wanted. You know that didn't promote the doctrine. And so uh, even without even without all of that. Um, I, I had gone, you know, obviously I went to high school and, and studied, you know, physics and, and biology and, you know, all the things, chemistry that you study in high school and, and had somewhere in the midst of that, fortunately developed an appreciation for, um, you know, the scientific method and understanding how to get to the bottom of something. Obviously, you don't necessarily apply the scientific method to, to, to scripture, but you do, you do understand how to compare documents and to, um, you know, have a, a logical chain of thought from, you know, from one concept to the next. And, and so I, 
instinctively applied that to my Bible study. And and boy, I tell you, that really screwed me up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that caused all kind of problems. Sure. You know, yeah. You know, I, I guess you know. I guess every child, you know, hears their parent at some point say, "Do it because I said so." You know, because mm-hmm. I'm the parent. And 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 there's something in every child that I think instinctively rebels against that idea. You know, of doing something just because the authority said so. So when I would run into that wall of, well, this is where it takes faith, you know, this is where you just have to, um, you know, accept that that the people before you were smarter than you. I was just like, well, you know, they probably were, but that I, I can't get up and repeat that until I know it for myself. So that started at the very beginning of my ministry. The the eternal punishment, eternal punishment was was the beginning of the end. Hmm. Um, you had mentioned that your deconversion was sort of a five-tier process, if you will. You became increasingly yeah. more liberal. What put you over the edge from becoming a liberal Christian to becoming, I guess, an atheist? Yeah, uh, somewhere towards the middle of the process, keep in mind that, that I, I spent – a, a large portion of my ministry, much like a guy hanging onto the edge of a skyscraper, you know, I I spent most of my ministry just clawing and and using every bit of energy that I could to hang on and stay wherever I was at, because I I didn't know that there was um, I didn't know there was another way to live. I didn't know what life would be like outside of the church and in particular outside of the ministry. I just could not imagine a life where I was not uh, you know, publicly speaking and privately counseling people in their situation. And so um, somewhere towards the middle of, of, of this just dilemma – I not somewhere I can tell you exactly where Des Moines, Iowa, at the Gospel Assembly Church. Mm. Uh, I um, and and I, I I list all of those you know nouns on purpose um, simply because I I, I want to give a shout out to to all of my ex Gospel Assembly friends who are now atheists that were really some of the first people to to support me and to show me community whenever I started coming out. Um, oddly enough, this extremely conservative church has produced uh, some of the most beautiful atheists <laughs> in the movement. <laughs> um, uh, but but at this church, uh, you know, my my wife and I were having a real crisis. She hated it, and she decided that she was going back to Louisiana uh, with or without me. And I went to the pastor for counseling, as I had been taught to do all my life, and he basically told me to let her go. You know that um, that it was God's will for me to stay there and and you know that to let her go and and I have oh. told this before, but it's very funny. He basically said that if it was God's will for us to be together, then she would uh, go back to Louisiana, fall on hard times, and and may actually have to turn to prostitution to feed our child, oh. and uh, <laughs> and then she'd come back and then I'd be in charge. That's just despicable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It, it is. It's 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 very sad. And so he sits down next to me and he opens up the Bible and he actually showed me New Testament um, passages to support his doctrine. And it wasn't some vague, twisted, misty view of the scriptures that made it work. It was very clear and clean interpretations of these New Testament passages. And and while he sat there showing me that, instead of being convinced that that's what I'm supposed to do, instead, I I literally had a moment of awakening. I I had an epiphany, if you will, and I I said to myself, I thought, oh my gracious, mm-hmm. this whole time I thought the problem was the people that I was associated with. You know that that I wasn't getting to the bottom of the truth. Uh, the whole time the problem has been the Bible. <laughs> the, the Bible's mm-hmm. the problem. And and unfortunately, that was that was like halfway in my ministry, um, because I I was still clawing to to stay involved in the ministry, and you know I did things to make my conscience feel better. Like every so often, I'd get up and I'd preach out of the Jeffersonian Bible, you oh, know, wow. just to, <laughs> just to uh, you know, just to, I don't know, just just trying trying everything to just survive, sure. you know, 
just trying to survive. So, so once I once I realized that the Bible was man made, okay, I was an atheist. I just didn't fully realize it because this whole concept, this whole this whole idea, was being balanced. It's almost as if it's almost as if you've seen you've seen these guys who spin plates, you know, these plate spinners, mm -hmm. you know, on these rods. Um, it was it was almost like the whole concept of of God was spinning on this one rod called the Bible, and and once that rod was broken, then plates just begin to drop left and right, uh, and and I, I did everything I could do to catch them, you know, I really did. Do you believe that everything you've gone through and this process, is this something every believer can do? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I really, to be honest with you, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel the same way now that I felt then. I don't feel like there's anything special about me. I don't feel like I'm smarter than the average person. Um, I know that I'm taller and better looking than the average person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can't get away with that because no. y'all saw me in Augusta. I Dang met it. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I I don't think I don't think that I've I don't think I possess any characteristics that are you know that that everyone else doesn't possess. So so from that point of view, yes, I think this is something that everyone can go through. What 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 I'm afraid is is that not everyone goes through the same course of life that I've gone through. Thus, not everyone feels compelled the way that I felt compelled to get to the bottom of things the way that I felt compelled. Number mm -hmm. one, I, I, I truly, truly think that 90% of Christians, just picking on Christians right now, but it probably applies to all religions, but that's not my experience field. 90% of all Christians live 90% of their lives as if they were atheist. Yeah. yeah. You know, they still change the batteries in their smoke alarms. That's right. They go to the doctor when they're sick. They still go to the doctor. They still scream for somebody to take them to the emergency room if they think they're having a heart attack. You know, I mean, they, they live their lives like normal, like normal people. Um, or maybe statistically like abnormal people. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but but every so often, for some reason, um, conscience does get the better of us. Life causes us to. It's almost as if it's almost as if our lives are very compartmentalized. You know, sure. and it's it's kind of like you know you've got a guy who may have been able to live his whole marriage. Without an affair, and I'm definitely not. I'm definitely not comparing pursuing the truth with something that people would think was immoral. But I'm just using this as an example. Um, he may be able to live his whole life without ever having an affair, but it just so happens that the right person comes along at the right time and says the right thing, and and it opens up a part of him that maybe would not have been opened otherwise. You know, hmm. and and I kind of feel like that's what goes on for some of us is that. The right life experience, the uh, – you know, who knows? I mean sometimes it can even be the right YouTube video or the right podcast that you stumble across <laughs> that makes you go, wow, you know, I, I never thought of that before. And and, and if, if all the stars are aligned just right at that moment, then you may go, I'm going to look into that. But if you're if you're cruising through life and life is is under a total different situation for you, you may just go. That was just a test of my faith, and I'm just going to continue on, you know, happily down my merry way. So, well, I so, think that's the thing that uh, separates the, the people that do walk away and the people that stay in is that the people that walk away, when that moment comes, when they find that book or video or whatever. Yeah. They have to have the intellectual bravery and courage yeah. to, yes. you know, get to the end of the book and really consider what those ideas are are yes. for them. So, yeah, and and the reason I, it probably sounds as if I'm I'm giving believers a lot of slack, um, 
But but one of the reasons I feel like that that life itself plays a very important role as to whether or not a person possesses that level of courage at that moment is because there were so many times prior to my final realization that that I I myself could have gone further. You know that I I, I could have gone a, a step further than that. I mean, the moment I, I can tell you one that I've never told anybody before. I don't think, if if you don't mind, I don't mean to eat up all of our time. Is that okay to go with the story? Um, I I remember I was I was um, I was filling in for a pastor at a United Pentecostal church in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. And I'd made real good friends with with one of the the more active members of the church, and he was he was he may have been Sunday school superintendent as well as a Sunday school teacher, but his name was Lonnie, and he was he was a fantastic guy. He and I made fast friends, wonderful guy. And so he in his Sunday school class, you know, he the United Pentecostals they get their literature from headquarters just like everybody else gets it from their headquarters, and this particular lesson was. Uh, against once saved, always saved, or, or more particularly against being saved only by faith. See, I come from such a unique form of Pentecostalism that we actually don't believe that you're saved by faith the way that the majority of Christianity does. We, mm-hmm. we're, we're, real, we're real quick to say, no, it's, it's faith and works. Okay. okay. And so, um, and so his little Bible study was, was debating against that. And so he gives me the Bible study, gives me the, the booklet, the Sunday school booklet. And he says, you know, would you read over this and see if you can find some extra points, you know, that I, that I don't know about or some stories that I could tell for the Sunday school class. I said, sure. So I'm reading it. And as I'm reading it, I can clearly see that there's much more, um, biblical support for the idea of faith and faith alone than there was for faith and works. For the first time, I see that. I've been in the ministry preaching for years, and for the first time, I see that. I mean, it's almost like a a Martin Luther moment, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a justification moment. Well, that was a moment where I could have, had life been a little different, I could have said, well, man, if I had that wrong, what else do I have wrong, Mm -hmm. you know? And and maybe to a degree I did, but I didn't do it all in one weekend. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> sure. I, did, I did it over the course of years. So, you but know, it's impressive I, I, that you could say to yourself that you got it wrong instead of the other people got it wrong. Yes. Now there there is there is a a disease uh, within uh, Christianity in particular where a person is so blinded by their own ego that they can't even imagine that what they belong to isn't the best. Mm-hmm. And and that's dangerous. You know, I um, we had a little debate uh, at the Midwest Free Thought Conference here a few weeks ago. We had a couple of Christians, and, and it was me and Sarah Moorhead uh, having a discussion with them, trying not to have a debate, but a discussion. And, you know, the question was asked, um, out of all of the religions in the world, how can you be so sure that yours – is the right one and that your version of it is the right one and once again using my superpowers of you know of transparency i said it's very easy it's very easy to explain why i not only thought that christianity was right that pentecostalism was right but that my church was the rightest and that i was the rightest of everyone in my church (laughs) it's very easy to explain explain that and it's because it was me (laughs) yeah it's (laughs) that simple it's that simple. It's because it was me. I was the guy believing it. So, you know, yeah, a person really has to be able to get past that. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you the secret to that. The secret to being able to get past that is humility. And that sounds like a no-brainer, but a person has to, within Christianity, they have to truly see their faults. They have to be, um, they have to be embarrassed by their faults. They have to be embarrassed by their weaknesses. They have to be afraid of their weaknesses. And as a Pentecostal preacher, I was horrified that my personal weaknesses um, were going to be exposed and that they were going to eventually destroy my ministry. You know, and, and I'm not talking about that, you know, like I was into bestiality or something, you know. 
you know. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't worried about getting caught in the corner with the dog. I was, you know, I, I was, I was just, I was a normal guy. I mean, I started preaching at seventeen, you know, wow. and 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 you couldn't even say the M word, masturbation, you know, out loud. Oh boy. You know, I mean, that wasn't. I mean, we were strictly told. My pastor taught us that if you had a sexual dream, okay, all right, if you had a sexual dream, when you woke up from that dream, you were to jump out of bed, fall on your knees, and beg God for forgiveness because it, you couldn't have that dream if that perversion wasn't in you. And so, you know. I mean, I was horrified of of of. I, I realized very quickly that that Christianity outlaws being a human, and and so and I I, I borrow that from Mike Williams uh, of the Gospel Revolution in Houston, Texas, and so I um, you know I I I was humbled. I was humbled by the realization of my own weaknesses, and and that made me be able. Whenever I saw something to say, maybe I'm the one that's wrong and not them. Is it Mr. Jerry DeWitt's will that all people should become atheists? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yes, I guess so. Um, yeah. Is that a better world? Do you think? I think it can be a better world. Yes, I, I, I think I think it can be a better world. I think a a secular world. Let me let me let me back up and. And you know, be all wibbly wobbly, and you know, um, you know, mess around with this idea for a moment. I obviously think a truly secular government would produce a better world. That's indeed. That's a fact. Mm-hmm. I definitely can. I get a Darwin? I <laughs> can. I get a Darwin? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I definitely. I definitely think a secular government worldwide. A worldwide secular government. Uh, I don't have any problems with uh, a one-world government heading towards the Federation. You know, uh, Star Trek. I'm speaking Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I think a secular United States would make for a much better United States for everyone. And then, if a person, um, for whatever reason, as a free United States citizen, chose to be religious well then obviously that would be their choice and and as long as it was something that was always uh private and i don't mean private like they have to go hide in the back of their house to do it obviously within a secular united states you would still have the right for churches and you know freedom of speech and expression of religion and and all of those things the the issue i have is is that i'm i there are countless things that religion does well, that religion does very well, that we need to emulate for sure. The free and, thought movement needs to? Yeah, the, the free thought movement okay. needs, needs to emulate. Now, it's always going to be tricky. It's always going to be tricky for free thought participants to emulate these things for, for two very important reasons. One is because many people who participate in the free thought movement have been very hurt by religion. Mm-hmm. And so they're very sensitive to religion. Um, which which city was I in? Oh, I think once again it was the Midwest Conference. I, I had someone I, I, I preached. I, I just preached and you know I told everybody I was going to and I got up and preached a message called Embrace Your Pain. And um, and it was it wasn't my fun and funny and fun loving you know uh, take on things as I generally try to be, but it was very serious. I was in a very serious place at that moment in my on in my own life, and I've always spoken from where I was at personally at that moment, and so it was a little more down and it was uh, a little more um, serious, and so. Uh, I had a person come up to me afterwards and and say that it totally freaked them out and that they hated every second of it. Wow! You know, because they were so wounded by religion and that particular, you know, that was the particular preaching style that they were under when they were being mistreated. And I and I understand that, and that's the reason why most of the time I, I ask for permission, you know, before I go off into that, you know, that way of talking. Um, so, so number one, it's always going to be hard for free thought people to emulate any version of 
religious characteristics because they've been hurt by religion. The other thing is is that there's just a, a new world view in the minds of, of these free thinkers. You know, and it's I'll do what I want to, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and don't don't even act like you're obligating me to something. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and and so that's always going to be that's always going to be tricky to get over. But once the secular movement is able to truly get community down pat, once they make community um, a much higher priority, and some are doing this now. But once all once all you know secular groups by and large are doing this building community, then religion is going to have um, not just stiff competition; it will truly have seen the end of its of its market. You know, we'll begin to eat more and more and more of that market share. So, so community is obviously something that religion has down pat that we need to emulate. Do you think the uh, free thought movement, in a way, is sort of in its adolescence in the same way that uh you know a 18 year old just has graduated college and they go or graduated high school and they go off to college and they're partying hard and like oh freedom i could do what i want but then once you're done with that phase of life you kind of grow up a little bit and and become an adult yeah I, i think i think that's fair to say and and i think if we looked at 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 american history alone um it, it might even be more accurate to say that it, it's almost making a reference <clears throat> back to Star Trek again. It's <laughs> it, it's it's almost like um, I wish I could remember an episode in particular, but it, it, we're really having our second adolescence. We're really going through this for at least the second time because it, it, it's as if we've gone through some type of transporter accident and we've been made children again as a as a as a you know, world as a world group, and and we're having to grow up for a second time because if you go back and you look at the humanist movement, which is 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 now what we really refer to as the free thought movement, all these words have been used in a lot of different ways. The humanist movement was extremely prevalent and powerful in American history much earlier on, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, unfortunately, they took a couple of wrong turns. And are what appears to be wrong turns with you know twenty twenty hindsight, and and they lost their momentum, and and they lost their percentage of the market, you know the intellectual market, and we're just now regaining that. So so yeah, it's definitely an adolescent phase from my point of view, but unfortunately, it's like the second time that we're having to go through this adolescent phase, and and I think that we're on the verge of. Not a make or break, but we're we're definitely on the verge of some major, um, almost natural selection processes going on, because I don't think you can have. Here, here, here's what I think the ugly secret is: is that religion is really just a byproduct of human nature, a byproduct of human culture, and obviously it's been taken to an its its extreme, and uh, has been very. Uh, damaging to history. We know that. I'm not arguing for religion by by and large in any way. But I think what we're going to begin to see is that the larger our groups become and the longer they exist, the more uh, tendency we're going to have to have to incorporate certain things that we would look back and call religious concepts in order to maintain our groups and our organizations and to go further, mm-hmm. you know, um, because that's just part of, of human nature. You know, um, obviously we'll be doing it without a deity. Obviously we'll be doing it without apostles and prophets, you know, as much as we all admire Dawkins, we're never going to hold him up like a Muhammad or, or a <laughs> Jesus, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not in our worldview to do those things, even though we're criticized that way from time to time by the ignorant, 
but um, and I say that affectionately by people who don't understand because they're not involved. Mm-hmm. Um, right? They but, think that we're the following the religion of evolution or something weird like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, it's just another religion. Y'all all meet up, and sit in folding chairs. It's just another religion. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know. Well, then so is sitting in the lobby of the emergency room. Right. You know? right. <laughs> you know? um, and, and and so you know it's a uh, but. But what will what will happen as as people, for instance, already there's been you know certain documents that certain policies has had to been you know had to be put in place uh, to just deal with the fact that you've got a lot of different types of people together in one place at one time. Well, you know, writing things down and setting rules can, from some people's perspective, be looked at as the beginning of founding a religion. Obviously, that's not what we're doing, but we're going. We're, but but it's just the natural byproduct of this, of people coming together. And so, I think there's two issues in particular we need to emulate from religion. Number one is is we've got to get over this hang up we have about money. We've we've just got to get past this money thing. You know, like the raising of money is the same as you know building the Vatican or something. You know, um, because we're never going to be as politically viable as we can be. We're never going to be as socially effective as we can be if we don't learn how to raise at least a thousand times more money than what we're doing now. And and we're going to have to find a way to do it without the advantage that theistic religion has. You know, theistic religion is literally able to walk up to the stage and say, uh, you're going to make Jesus cry if you don't give. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, and, and we're so not going to be able to do that. You know, we're, we're never we're never going to be able to do it like that. So we're going to have to find other ways of of doing it, of motivating people. But, you know, there, there's there's a few people out there that have a lot of money and they share it very willingly. There's a lot of people out there that has little money and they share that very willingly willingly but there's still a huge middle ground there's still very wealthy people that that don't feel like contributing the way they would if they were theist in a church um you know and so so money money's going to be a huge issue that is something that's very important that religion does very well that we we have to overcome we have to get past that and it's just a shame it's a shame that whenever we started saying religion is the bad guy that we didn't make clear distinctions about which pieces of religion we thought were bad. So the 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 second the second issue I think that has to be dealt with and and it's um it's the most complicated probably even though the money issue seems to be so complicated this could be more so and it's the fear of of emotion actually um hmm. we know that religion uses emotion to manipulate and we know that that very clever charlatans are very good. All we got to do is is watch Christian television to know uh, how they're able to manipulate people who um, not not saying this in any disrespectful way, but in just for clarity, people who are somewhat weak minded are are in a very um, you know in 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 a crisis in their life in or a vulnerable position, on, perhaps. yeah, vulnerable to it at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so obviously we have we've stood against emotional manipulation as we should and as we should continue to do but there is an element of community that uh there's a bonding in community that only emotion can bring and so we have to find our balance as free thinkers as skeptics um we we have to find our balance of how we can enjoy emotion without being manipulated by it or attempting to manipulate other people by it. And I think right now, I think we've got our settings so high uh, at the moment that if something happens in a meeting that makes us feel something, we consider that manipulation. You know, if someone got played a video and the video made us sad, 
then we were our settings are set our sensitivity settings are set so high right now that we're like beep 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 emotions emotions uh we're being manipulated and 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 I don't think that's fair I don't think that's beneficial to the non-theist community um because that's just part of being human it you you could you could then say the same thing by going and uh and and watching a movie you know, you could walk in and say, "Oh, they're trying to manipulate." Well, of course they are. You yeah. know, but but to a degree, for a particular purpose, and for a a very certain for a moment. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> while you're watching the movie, and and I think the same thing needs to be true inside of our meetings. We need to incorporate music. We need to incorporate visuals. We need to incorporate all of the things that makes coming together as a group that much more enjoyable um, and satisfying. And I think we're all smart enough and far enough away from religion that it's not like suddenly, you know, a, a facilitator of a free thought group is going to become a cult leader and make us all wear jumpsuits and, or drink Kool-Aid mm-hmm. or, you know, try to catch Haley's Comet the next time it comes by, you know, I mean, <laughs> I guess it can happen, but if it does, then then shame on the people in that group, you know. But I don't think it can happen in most most places at most times. So, you know, I attended um, a meeting in Dallas, and they've got a band. And now to meet a balance, um, most of the songs that the band played were um, were very, you know, were funny. They were meant to be funny, you know. But but you still had rhythm, and you, and you still you still had the the sense of camaraderie that's that's only created when people are clapping hands together you know i mean so it, it's tricky but but it's also very necessary and we've got such wonderful artists you know within our movement um that we that we need to take advantage of you know we we there's no reason why um, you know, our, our meetings can at the same times, you know, be galleries, you know, where before and after the meeting, people are walking around looking at the artwork of, you know, of the artist within the group. There's mm-hmm. no reason, you know, that you can't have a person get up and, and recite a poem. Y- you've got, you know, Shelley from Australia. Uh, she, she's got some, some wonderful, she's got a wonderful album out and, uh, is traveling around and, and, and it's cool that people are are using her as a special event, you know, within within the movement. Um, but I think maybe that will break the ice a little bit, and eventually people will be like, you know, it'd be cool if we just had a little guitar music, you know, at every at every event. Yeah. So I, I think we'll get there. It takes a balance. There's no doubt about it. It takes a balance. Can I ask you one more thing, Jerry, about um, Christianity, and that is, what is the the primary cost of being a Christian. Yeah. The primary cost from my point of view, and obviously, you know, there would there would easily be, you know, ten thousand Christians who would disagree with me because they look at things from a different perspective. But having been a Christian really my entire life, um, and now being much further outside of Christianity than I would have ever imagined myself able to be. To me, the primary cost is the loss of identity. To me, that's the primary cost, is that there's only one you that, as far as we know, now there may be a copy of you somewhere in a multiverse, somewhere that, <laughs> you know, that you'll never be able to talk to, most likely. You know, but as far as we know, there's, there's only one version of you this one time in this one life for a very short time. And as a Christian, instead of being compelled to express that uniqueness to its fullness, instead you are compelled to emulate someone who may or may not have existed 2,000 years ago. And and I think I think that's a crime. I think that is a very very sad way to live. Now, because almost every version of Christianity is getting more and more liberal, 
there's a lot of people that would run to Christianity's defense and say, oh, no, 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 I'm a natural born golfer and I love to golf and I golf every weekend and I, you know, so I'm expressing myself through golfing, you know, golfing is, is it. Well, and, and they would say, and I belong to the Golfers for Jesus club, you know, and, and so, you know, my Christianity is actually helping me express, well, it's such a convoluted notion. These, these very liberal um, concepts that allows people and, – and, and there's the key word. It allows people a certain amount of leash. You know, um, liberals, yes, they may be able to – the bottom line is the liberals, their leashes are just longer than the conservatives. That's all it is. But they're still tied back to an identity that if they go too far, their neck will be yanked. Because they there are limitations as to what parts of themselves of their identities they can and cannot express and and i think I think that's the saddest part I really do, and I think that it is so incorporated and in, integrated into our society that people who've never even walked through church house doors are still affected by it and don't even know it. Yeah, I'd say so. And I think this this what you're talking about, this lack of individuality can really lead a person to live their life with a certain amount of depression and not be able to face the source of that, that being the, you know, the Christian doctrine itself. I mean, I met a nice fellow um in Augusta after your talk and he said he battled with depression for a, for a long time and then as soon as he left religion, he was just it was just went away. He was yes. just much a healthier person. Yes, uh, that that's exactly right. Um, it, religion, like I say, whether you've ever been a religious member or not, because it's part of our culture, part of what it means to be in the United States, it it literally shapes the brain that you're the only brain that you have to work with. And and so you you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know you don't know what's wrong when what's wrong is you. You know the way that you've been taught to think, the way that your brain has developed within this very hyper religious culture, and so it 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 is astonishing when you get out of it to be able to look back and go, good. Yes, look at look at the way that affected me. Look at how how I made decisions based off of that. I still today to this day, of course it's it's only been a year, but I I still struggle with this 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 concept of of total self-sacrifice for the sake of every other priority. You know, or at the sake, or you know, uh, at the risk of every other, at the cost of every other priority. I still, I still wrestle with that because that's that's how that's how I was raised. That's what my family and the church that we were involved in uh, taught me to think. And 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 from one point of view, it sounds it sounds heroic. You know, oh, complete and total self sacrifice. But it's like everything else in life. It 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 has to be put into its proper context and it has to be used appropriately you know um we could we could very rightfully say that the kamikazes you know fighting for imperialist japan um had the devotion of complete and total self sacrifice but if you look at it from as a global citizen you would say but it was for the wrong reason you know it was yep. for a very poor and 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 destructive reason and so I'm just now trying to get my – trying to literally rewire my brain to not think that way all the time about everything and say, you know, every once in a while it is okay if it benefits Jerry or if it, you know, if something benefits Jerry's family. You know, it's it's okay to not completely sacrifice yourself 100 percent all the time. And that's just one example of the many – many areas in which religion shapes our worldview. Yeah, it just goes to show that there's a huge need for secular therapists and counselors out there. Yes, uh, there is definitely a need for for therapists who are committed to using um, secular 
methods. And we first discovered that in our dealings with participants with recovering from religion. Obviously, you know Dr. Dale Ray, which is um, you know um, also involved uh, in in therapy himself, in being a therapist, a counselor, psychologist, um, has written some great books that helps people recover from religion. He founded Recovering from Religion, and in in his experience and our experience, it became obvious very quickly. One of the neat things about being out of religion and no longer being the man of God, you know, who's supposed to have an answer for everything, is to be able to sit across the table from somebody and say, yeah, that's a pretty serious issue. We're probably not going to fix it by handing you a new book, you know, by, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> by Michael Schumer or, or Dan Barker or Richard Dawkins or whoever. Um, you, you probably need to get some help with that. You know that's pretty serious, and so yeah, you need to you need to seek some some professional help. And it's it's great to be free to do that now. I used to have to do that almost in secret when I was a preacher, because I I, I realized um, towards the end of my ministry that I really didn't have the answer for everything. And so you know, once counseling got so far, I'd be like, you know, you need to go see a therapist. You need to see somebody and then hope that that person you know didn't go tell everybody in the congregation that I was sending them to therapist because <laughs> that was that was seen almost as a form of like witchcraft or something oh you know? man oh. <laughs> yeah the therapist was going to jack around with your brain in a bad way and you know and all of this but so we realized that people were going from recovering from religion, they were seeking out the help of therapists, and then they would come back to us and say, well, guess what? I took your advice, and they told me my problem was I needed to get my religion straight. And so uh, so Dr. Delray uh, started the Secular Therapist Project. And so a person can, can simply go to a secular therapist. I think they may be .org. Um, if not... They can go to the Recovering from Religion website, recoveringfromreligion.org, uh, and go to the Secular Therapist page from there. And they can find a therapist, hopefully somewhere near them, that has committed to being to using just secular um, methods. And here's what's crazy about the United States that we live in. I hear Christians all the time uh, say you know, how persecuted they are. You know, because they have to like see gays on television or something. Please, you know, know, (laughs) in the world they're being persecuted. Um, These therapists are themselves in hiding, Um, and so Mm -hmm. because if they come out in their communities as being secular, then they'll lose a large portion of their clients. They'll be ostracized in their communities, and so just like we did with the with uh, the clergy project, where people were able to be there anonymously, we we vet these therapists. Not not I, but Dr. Dale Ray and the other therapist that he has on his team. They vet these therapists to make sure they are who they say they are in secret, in private, um, and that they really are committed to to these secular. Uh, you know, to a secular philosophy, and then whenever the patient, the patient can then, the client can then um, come on the website and they can apply for help anonymously, and they will connect with a therapist who is also anonymous, and it's not until they have built a relationship either over the phone or over email that they then have the option of disclosing their identities to each other. I mean, that's that's how messed up this society is that we live in today. That that therapist, yeah, <laughs> yeah, wow, are have have to you know conceal their identity, you know. But yes, it but does, at least it we does. have that uh, this thing in place to 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 work around that. Yes, so and- that's good. And and if any of your listeners, if they know of a therapist that they think might would be interested in in working with this project, um, please have them go to the website. Even if they have to go through recovering from religion to get there, uh, you can just Google it the ther- the secular therapist project, and um, and and please please connect their therapist to us because the more we have, obviously the better job we can do for the community. Great, great. 
Well, I thought we'd finish up with just some general questions. We have some um, from listeners that wanted to ask you some questions. Then uh, Steve and I have a few that we'd like to ask you just to kind of wrap things up, if that's all right. Sure. Okay. I have one uh, from actually a believer, and she asks, how do you know now that the feelings you are experiencing during a religious experience uh, yes. w- now weren't really from God? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Two parts, and, and that's important. Um, number one would be is because through my religious studies, two two important things happened. Number one is I came to the opinion. All right, I don't know if y'all seen my little credo that I that I created, um, but it but it says um, skepticism is my nature. Mm, yes. You know, free thought is my methodology. Agnosticism is my conclusion. So I came to the conclusion of being an agnostic and that atheism is my opinion. Mm-hmm. And so through, you know, through my life – and, of course, humanism is my motivation. So through my life study, um, both, both intellectually and emotionally, uh, exper- you know, through my own experience, I came to the conclusion that there's no way to know that there is or is not a god, agnosticism. My opinion – based on the lack of evidence for a God, is that there is not one. So right there, that's square one. Now that I no longer believe that there is a God, well, then obviously I no longer believe that those experiences were from God because I don't believe there was a God. So that that's probably going to be the biggest hurdle for a believer to comprehend, to go through. Part, part two of this is in the process of walking my way through this, um, I, I read a lot of different literature involving neurology, religious experience, and I found out that there are physical, biological um, explanations for everything that I ever experienced. And now, a, a believer can go, well, okay, uh, so science can duplicate these experience you know you can sit with a god helmet on and feel as if you're in contact with you know a heavenly father that doesn't mean that people aren't really experiencing it the problem you have there is is once again now you have a god who is creating confusion because why doesn't he give you an experience that science can't duplicate if he's only giving you experiences that science can explain and duplicate, then he's not he's not really being fair now, is he? And, and so so there's a there's a lot to that, but but that's that's the two quick answers is that through my studies I've come to the conclusion that that I don't believe that there is a God, and then secondly, everything that I experienced actually has an explanation. And I would throw this out to the believer as well, okay? Um, I'm going to assume that they're a Christian. Doesn't mean that they are. Okay. Has this person ever studied these experiences? Has he only had the experiences and not studied the experiences? That that's 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 an important issue there. Okay, because you can have the experience, and and obviously to you it feels real and feels as if the explanation that you have is the only correct one. But those same experiences that Christians have, Hindus have those same experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, Muslims have those same experiences. Uh, Bring it a little closer to home, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons have those same experiences. So how do you explain that those people have those same experiences? Well, as a fundamentalist Pentecostal, our first explanation was, well, that's the devil. (laughs) The Mm -hmm. devil is creating these counterfeit experiences. All of those people are having counterfeit experiences, you're having the real experience. Well, how can you be so certain that yours isn't the counterfeit, that yours isn't the one from the devil, and that theirs are correct? Mm. You know, so, exactly, exactly. So, so, so somewhere at this, you have, to, you have to find a grounding point. You have to find a point that you can begin to build off of. And if you build off of the fact that the experience can be duplicated, scientifically explained, 
now you've got something to stand on. And what it says is that it's it's not demons giving them counterfeit. It's that they have they share the same um, neurology. They share the same a uh, nervous system as a human being that you share, and that's why they have the same types of experiences. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is will be the same question that I had asked you in Augusta, and um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how much um, opposition and how much ostracization you've felt in your community, and uh, have you experienced any shunning? And with all of that, why have you decided to stay there? Why not move <laughs> away and restart somewhere else? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of layers to both sides of that question. Um, number one, um, I, I've definitely received more criticism uh, via the Internet than people have been brave enough to do in person. Oh, um, our, you know, um, fortunately, fortunately, I was forced to really go deeper into my community uh, than than I have over the last year. Whenever uh, a reporter came to town and spent four days with me, and you know, I, I felt unwelcome because of things that I had received over the internet via Facebook, Facebook postings. Emails, you know, primarily emails, even phone calls. Um, I, I felt very unwelcome, very unwelcome um, in in my town, and so I would do crazy things like drive forty five minutes, you know, to go to the store, <laughs> you know, instead of going to the store that's five minutes away. Yeah, I would even I even went and got my hair cut forty five minutes away to not have to get it cut in town where I'd run into people, mm-hmm. and and so over the internet, people were very bold. You know, much much like uh, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. You know, he received supposedly criticism because he was very bold in his letters, even though he was very kind in person. You know, <laughs> and uh, and so so people have been very bold over the internet. But whenever I would face those same people face to face, they would they would. Um, really kind of chicken out to be honest with you they mm-hmm. they would chicken out and and i think when they would see me face to face it brought them back to the consciousness that i had always gone out of my way to be extremely good to everyone and i think it was just harder i think it was just harder to be mean to me in person and so if I stayed around them long enough, just like with the reporter being with me, then eventually they would feel obligated to defend their point of view and, you know, to say, well, you know, we're very disappointed or we're, you know, we're very confused by what Jerry has done. But they wouldn't, you know, give me the warnings from God that they would give me online, you know. <laughs> um, and, and, and even, you know, a couple of nights ago, as I mentioned earlier, I went to a police jury meeting and, and you know, Nobody failed to – there was only a couple of people that I could tell was staying back away from me. It was it was real interesting. One of the employees of the police jury, um, when she made eye contact with me, her eyes got as big as saucers. <laughs> and she couldn't believe that I was actually there. And she immediately turned to the person next to her and you know began to whisper something to him. And I saw him glance over her shoulder a couple of times, trying not to make direct eye contact with me, but to look and make sure he knew who she was talking about, you know. And so, you know, but she was about the only one that acted weird. Everybody else at least waved at me. A few people, you know, came by and shook my hand. But I'd worked in that community, you know, uh, in public service for, if you added it all up, for almost 10 years, you know. So so, so I know a lot of them, and, and they know the good that I've done. It was it was really kind of funny because I showed up at this police jury meeting on the very night that they were finishing um, or bringing to flourishion a project that I had actually initiated three years earlier. So that was kind of funny, <laughs> you know. But but they didn't. I didn't get any credit for it that night. Oh, no. <laughs> they, they didn't. They didn't mention my name. You know. So as far as ostracism, it's um, you know, it's a weird thing. I mean, I've got a neighbor. Um, that will not even look up as I pass by and wave, you know, um, you know, as I drive by, um, Uh they saw me talking to another neighbor and just stood in their yard and glared at, at the two of us, you know, I guess maybe trying to intimidate, 
you know, the other neighbor from talking to me. So, yeah, there, there's been a fair amount. There's been more ostracism from family and friends than than just people in the community. You know, I had a, a cousin who's a Assembly of God pastor that I preached for many times. And as soon as my Aunt Grace began to call everybody to tell them to pray for me, uh, he unfriended me on Facebook, and I've never heard another word from him. You know, and we were very, very close. Wow. And of course, you can look back at my best friend who fired me. You know, from my secular job. Um, so, so it's really been almost like the people closest to me are, are the ones that have been most fickle about things. Um, hmm. But then the second part of the question, you'll just have to tell me when I'm rattling on too much. You know how preachers are. Um, <laughs> but but the, the second part of the question is is really complicated. Um, Number one, I uh, – and you'll just have to forgive me if I get a little emotional because it's, it's, it's been a rough time. I understand. I, I, felt like, I felt like I had cost my family, my immediate family, my wife and my son, so much already. Um, you know, that they hadn't done it. I had done it by coming out. I, I had done this. You know, I left in order to commit identity suicide and to to get free of this preacher's you know persona. Um, we were we were bumping six figures, wow. and and first moving away from pastoring, you know, that cut it down, you know, to two thirds or a third of what it had been, and and then to leave City Hall, that you know that that killed the rest of it, and so. So, you know, we went from at one point bumping six figures to, um, you know, having our house foreclosed on. And and that's a lot. You know, I when I worked for City Hall, I had two different forms of retirement. I drove a city vehicle. Um, I had a name that my wife and son could be proud of in the community. Everybody knew me and – you know, and so you know, I I took them from having a a father and a husband that they could be very proud of in the community. Um, even just the Dewitt name was was a name that was mentioned in almost in reverence. To um, you know, to my wife having to answer questions about me. You know, mm-hmm. and um, I just. I, I just felt like, you know, my son, even though he's 20, uh, he's he's just started college, and, um, you know, this is home to him. It's been home to him for, for several years now. I I just felt like I had already cost them so much that if I could save the house, if I could just save the house, then then maybe, maybe, maybe we wouldn't have lost everything. You know, mm-hmm. and and I started that process not knowing that eventually the pressure would be so great on my wife being in the town that she herself would have to leave. You know, and and I was already engaged in the process of trying to save the house, and you know, then it, you know, then it carried with it the the stigma of if I actually left town and went with her. Thanks to the internet and thanks to what little bit of you know notoriety that I have gotten, do I not just carry with me the same problems that she's leaving town in order to avoid, mm-hmm. you know, to get away from? And so, um, so trying to save something, you know, just trying to salvage something from our old lives was a big reason of staying. And saving the house, and and to be honest with you, in the beginning, it wasn't so much of staying in this town; it was really just trying to save this house. We fell in love with this house, you know. We we we, and it's nothing special. It's probably one of the smallest houses on our street, but um, <laughs> but you know, it's yours. We would, yeah, but it's ours, and and we fell in love with it, and and you know, we would tell people we loved it like a person. It's like a member of the family, and um, and so I felt like it. If we could have picked the house up and moved it <laughs> to another town, to <laughs> to any of the towns that so you know that opened their arms so so you know wonderfully to us, then we would have done it. You know, but that just wasn't possible. And then, after I decided to save the house, I got rather hard headed about the town, and I statistically, uh, this may not be a, a very scientific statistic, but but what I what I've been told. Many times is that, especially for preachers, once they come out as non-believers, that in order to get 
any kind of peace in their life, they have to move at least 300 miles away from their, you know, from their original homes. And, and I just thought that has to eventually stop. You know, at some point, people have to put their foot down and say, y'all just have to deal with me. You know, mm-hmm. you just you just have to accept that there's now a different point of view in town, a vocal point of view in town. And you have to you have to as a town, you have to deal with the fact that I'm a very loving person and that I've always treated you well and that I don't believe in God. You know, you have to deal with that. It, it shouldn't be that I have to pick up and move and go live with people who don't have a problem with it, you know, as mm-hmm. a town. You have to deal with it the same way you had to deal with interracial marriage, the same way that you had to deal with you know openly homosexuals, the same way you've had to deal with a lot of other things or that you're dealing with a lot of other things. You have to deal with this as well. And so that's what we're doing, you know, I mean, until they start, you know, firebombing our house or something, we're, oh we'll be here, you know, well, we're, we're well. going to be here. And, and, and it's, and it's, I'm telling you, it's, it's not easy, you know, as I, as I've mentioned earlier, this reporter came, then the photographer came and we stood out in front for, for almost three hours. We stood in front of uh, the church that I worked out of taking pictures of me for this, for this story. And, and literally everybody and their brother drove by. You know, and and it's not easy to stand there. I mean, first off, it's awkward that you're standing outside, you know, with someone taking pictures of you, you know, mm-hmm. and you're just standing there feeling like a goofball, you know, mm-hmm. just for no other reason than mm-hmm. somebody just taking pictures of you. And I mean, we've got you know the the lighting equipment set up, so I mean, it's there's no way to not attract attention with it. Um, I've I've now got calls where people thought that we were filming <laughs> because oh. of the extra equipment, you know, that was out there. But it was it was just pictures and. Um, and you know, and everybody drove by, and 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 some people honked, and you know, some people just stopped and stared, you know, to try to figure out what was going on. And it and it's not, it is not easy to be a spectacle, you know, where you were once a superhero, you know, inside of your own town. But damn it, if if somebody doesn't do it, then how is this insanity ever going to get any better? You know, it just it just has to be done. And I hope that. With someone, I am the world's premier people pleaser, and <laughs> and if I can find the strength to do this, I hope that it encourages thousands of other people to do the same, and and that will take us in a direction that I think will be better for all of us. Well, I commend you for your incredible courage for that, and I think it's very important what you're doing. Well, thank you, thank yeah. you very much. I, I appreciate that. I just can't imagine what you've had to go through, and I'm so sorry for that. Um, we we do have another question that I think maybe lends itself well to what you just spoke on. How now do you find peace when you fall in hard times, whereas before you might have prayed and found solace? What do you do now? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I love this question, probably more than almost any. Here, Here's what's wonderful about this process. Uh, yes, I did. I took, as a Christian, I took great comfort in praying. I took great comfort in uh, the strength that I thought that I received from God, from my relationship with Jesus. Um, I felt empowered by the Holy Spirit. And and I walked through, obviously, many difficult times as a Christian thinking that I was being strengthened um, you know, by by God. Now that I no longer believe that there is a God, now what I have come to the conclusion of is that it was my own strength that carried me through all of those tough times when I was a Christian, which tells me that I still have that strength and that it was always me all along. And and so things are no different now than they were then. If I had the strength to go through it then, assuming, giving the credit to the wrong person, um, then I have the strength to go through it now, giving the credit to the right person, to myself. And, of course, that sounds somewhat egotistical, but it's just the facts. Mm-hmm. It's just the reality that as a human being – uh, we are so it, it, that that that's one of the detriments that religion does, is that it takes credit away from where credit is truly due, 
and that is to to humans. Yep. And and it and it it lessens our image of humanity. Where what we should be doing is we should every day we should stand in awe of the power of the majesty of of the human species. The capability of of humans is astonishing and should be all inspiring. And so once I was able to go back in time in my mind and take credit for all of those hard times that I went through, um, it, it's given me it's given me courage um, to stand in in these hard times. And there's a second side of that too is 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 the community that does exist within the free thought the non believing uh, movement. You know I am far from alone. Now obviously I would be. I would be lying to say that any email relationship that I may have, any Facebook relationship that I may have, even hundreds of them, are not able to um, somehow overcome the loneliness that I feel with my wife gone. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, nothing, nothing can replace that kind of relationship. But there's a there's a difference between being lonely. And being alone, and I go through moments where I'm very lonely because I am in this little town, you know, and it's just now just just me and my son, as far as I know of in this town that are standing for these principles, but at the same time, I know that I'm very far from alone you know i there there's no doubt in my mind that I could tweet for help and and literally have you know two dozen people immediately get in their car and start driving towards Louisiana without a second thought, you know, if not more. And so mm -hmm. I, 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 I do take a lot of strength in the relationships that have been formed. And that's what I always tell people to do. That is the very first thing that I tell people to do in recovering from religion is get connected and, and get inside of community. Do everything you can to to be as integrated in a new community as you can, so that you do have that support, you know, so so that the loneliness isn't compounded by actually being alone. That's wonderful advice. Yeah, because you're not. You're just simply not. I mean, it, it doesn't matter where you're at, what what stage you're at in your disbelief, or even just in your doubting. Um, just get on the internet, and and you'll you'll so quickly see that you're not alone, that you're not experiencing anything that hasn't – literally, we're not experiencing anything that hasn't been documented for hundreds of years. You know, this is it's, – it's, it's almost – it should almost be embarrassing to our culture that, that we haven't gone any further than what we've gone because when you pick up – I mean, you can pick up humanist books that are 100 years old. You know, and, mm -hmm, yep. and they're and they're saying the things that we're saying today. You Robert can, Ingersoll. You know, you can, yeah, exactly. You can you can read philosophers, you know, that are hundreds of years old, and 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 they they all had already worked all of this out in their minds, and you know, and so we're far from alone. This this is the natural progression of humanity, and it is both our privilege and our burden to to be at its formation and and so we'll you know I, i'm going to survive it i'm going to survive it with my own strength and as the wonderful song says with a little help from my friends mm -hmm. <laughs> love it that's great well i think um we probably ought to wrap it up here it's been a pleasure guys it's been a real pleasure talking with you jerry i i re appreciate your time and um just even after you're seeing you talk in Augusta, I feel like feel like I know you really well because you're just you're just that type of person. You, it's very obvious that you just love people, and so well, thank, well, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, again, um, thank you so much for coming on. It, it was really great talking to you, and I wish you the best of luck in everything that you do in the future. 
Thank you very much. Things are moving in the right direction. We, uh, have, we've saved the house. I've got a little part-time job that uh, is going to help with, with uh, some income, and, uh, and things are looking bright and looking up. So I appreciate, I appreciate your attention and your help. And if you ever get without a guest and get bored, um, just at a moment's notice, I'll gladly come back online. Okay. Sounds <laughs> well, good. You. Appreciate it so much. All right. Thanks, guys. So, uh, once again, thanks for tuning in to A Matter of Doubt. And um, if you have any comments about today's episode, just uh, visit our blog, amatterofdoubt.com, or you can uh, send us an email, amatterofdoubt at gmail.com, or you know, check us out on Twitter, follow us, and keep up with the uh, latest episodes and uh, whatever tweets I may have for you. So, until next time, just remember that when it comes to religion, it is always... A matter of doubt.